Well, hello. It is Friday, July 10th. I am your host, Halston Body. Ooh, my lip gloss be popping. And hey, you've tuned in too. New job. Who dis? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, as I said, Halston Body. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me for this delightful second episode, the sophomore episode of New Job Who Dis. I am very glad you could join us. As I said, uh, we are exploring 20 plus years in the American job market through my eyes, through my experience so that I can share with you perhaps some perspective, perhaps some hope for you as somebody who might be seeking a job, you might be stuck in a job somewhere that you don't even know what to do with. You may hate your day job and you dream of getting out of it. You, There's so many possibilities with this podcast and vidcast for those watching at home on the YouTube. Yeah, I said it like that. Uh, at the end of the day, I really want you to just soak in some of my successes, some of my failures. Take from this podcast what you will, because at the end of it, I really just want to share all of the trials and tribulations I have been through in the uh, workforce since I was a mere 14 years old. If you tuned in the last episode, which played on Monday, that's right, we're going to be doing these episodes Monday and Friday to get you through your work week. If you enjoyed that episode. Well, I'm so glad that you're along for the ride. Buckle up. You're going to need it because this next this next episode is going to be a fun one. Uh, this was my first journey into actually having a job that I would have to show up for. As you may have heard from the last episode, I my first job was being a paper boy at the ripe old age of 14 years old. And uh, it was definitely the kickstart into uh, my entrepreneurial spirit, uh, creating that hustle inside of how to make something happen for yourself. And real talk, if you uh, review the episode, winning that CD player after hustling and gaining all those subscriptions definitely sparked that fire within. But let's move on. Let's move on to the next episode uh, of what job adventure I found myself getting into at the age of 15. Now, as I said before, with the uh, paperboy position, I don't remember why I quit or how I quit. I don't, I, I, it wasn't in bad terms because I didn't hate the job. Uh, I feel like there was a point where I probably outgrew it, but I also uh, got to the age of 15. And I do believe that in Milwaukee County, uh, and in Wauwatosa, the city of where I was living at the time, when you got to 15 and you were in high school, you could get onto a early work release program. What that essentially meant is just you basically needed permission from your parents. And if I'm not mistaken, your school, uh, my high school had to approve that I could work because I, I feel it was some sort of like legal thing where they didn't want you dragging yourself into school and then they couldn't figure out why, but they couldn't punish you because you were working. They knew that there was some sort of release program that they allowed 15 year olds to start working before the apparent normal age of 16 when everyone started getting their, you know, high school jobs. I was the go getter, of course, because I already had a job at 14. So why not continue the cycle? I uh, I ended up landing a position as a dishwasher as my first official going to work job where the, the work didn't come to me like the papers did in the previous job. I had to go to a, a, a place of employment and actually clock in and learn responsibility and not be late and things like that. All the building blocks and foundations that come along with having a day job, I had to learn that in my short stint 
at the, uh, at, at the restaurant that I worked at. The restaurant I worked at was a place, funny enough, that still exists. It's still on the corner of 74th and North Avenue in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Look it up. It is called Chinese Pagoda. I landed my first day job as a dishwasher in a Chinese restaurant, and it was probably the best thing ever as a first job. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. We'll get into that. Uh, the job, I, I believe I got the job via, you know, listings that were created or at least put into the local neighborhood via that work release program. I don't remember having to go in for an interview per se, because again, it was a dishwasher position and I was 15. So it was almost like they just kind of, like, I think it was based on the fact that you were doing that work release, that they trusted you were a decent employee. I think I still had to legally fill out some sort of application with no experience other than the working for the Milwaukee Sentinel. But I, you know, I got the job. Um, I remember the owner's name was Paul Young. And I don't remember his wife's first name, but I think out of respect, I think she was just Mrs. Young to me at the time. Um, really nice restaurant. Uh, it was back in the day. I mean, when we first moved out to Wauwatosa, I was 10 years old. And, um, excuse me, I got a little something on my eyelash there. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, I was, you know, I was 10 years old when we moved out to the West Side. And as I had mentioned before in the previous episode, we grew up poor. And I I'm not going to beat around the bush on that. That's not, it's not a slam on my family. It's, not, we weren't rich. We were middle class to poor. Uh, we got by, we had things, we had bills, we had debts, all the things. But we, by all means, were not living a lavish lifestyle in any way, shape, or form. So, knowing that, and because we, you know, growing up with not as much money and, you know, not as much spoilage in the, uh, you know, treat yourself food department, we rarely ate out. We, I, I don't remember as a, as a kid with my parents, like eating out in restaurants, barely ever. Uh, my, my mom cooked and so did my dad, but most of my mom cooked. It was, you know, whatever was cheap, lots of carbs, potatoes, breads. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and cheap family meals. So when it came time to Asian cuisine back in the mid eighties, it, there was no Panda Express. I just want to make sure everyone's aware of Quick, dirty, easy Chinese barely existed, uh, at least in Milwaukee. I know that there was a chain that came out in the 80s that was called Wong's Walk. And it was essentially mall Chinese in the uh, Milwaukee area. It's fantastic. It was the best Chinese food I had in a long time. Uh, but the, or the original Asian food that my family enjoyed was the Le Choy version out of the can that you got at the grocery store. So a whole lot of bean sprouts, a whole lot of water chestnuts, you know, whatever you can fit in the can that wouldn't spoil and is not fresh. And then of course, you know, you just made it with rice and La Choy. It's got chicken and gravy. Um, so the notion of spoiling ourselves as a family on Chinese food f made us feel like we were rich. We were rolling it. What? We get to order food and it's not, you know, we're not going to McDonald's and sharing a fry. What is this cuisine we're having? Sp uh, sparked my forever love for uh, Asian cuisine, Chinese food, uh, Americanized Chinese food, as we would all know it. Uh, one thing to note, too, about this restaurant back in the day, you could smoke in restaurants at that time. So not only did I work in an environment where people, I mean, nobody smoked in the kitchen while we were working or anything like that, but you know, there was a smoking section in the restaurant and place smelled like smoke. <laughs> I'd, I remember being a dishwasher having to wash ashtrays. I thought that was the grossest thing ever, Ugh. but I digress. You know, at the time, uh, as I said, we were, we were very into like, wow, we get to have Chinese food for dinner and Chinese pagoda before I even worked there was amazing. Uh, we, that was the closest place and whew, that food was so good. Um, the other thing that, 
as far as the time structure for you to understand the where we are in the universe of Chinese food, although orange chicken existed, it was not the go-to popular, like everybody just orders, you know, orange chicken for as part of it, you know, because it's the safe thing. Everybody loves it. And, you know, or um, Panda Express, you know, made it a thing. Orange chicken is the thing. And back then that wasn't it. You got chop suey. Uh, chicken chop suey was a big thing. Uh, also, uh, Kung Pao, you know, Kung Pao beef, Kung Pao chicken. And you got it with your steamed rice. Uh, you know, if you got, if you got fried rice, you usually got like barbecue pork fried rice because it was more of the cheaper meat versus the shrimp fried rice. Um, and you know, we never really got into the seafood stuff. Uh, but it was always just the cheaper stuff. We always mimicked what the La Choy was in the can. Uh, it was a fun job. I did not hate the job. It was messy. It was wet. It was smelly. I mean, you're washing dishes. You're learning how to use that spray hose that's hanging off the big uh, spring uh, wire that's, you know, draped over the big sinks. And you've got the, I learned chemicals. I learned how to fill a dishwasher with the soaps and, you know, these big industrial sized uh, dishwashers, uh, you know, I want to say before we ever ever really owned a dishwasher, I learned how to, uh, you know, fill your home dishwasher with your own dishes. I definitely feel like being a dishwasher at 15 taught me the essentials and the building blocks on how to, you know, maneuver as many possible dishes into your home dishwasher as possible. So thank you for that organizational tips, Chinese, <laughs> Chinese Pagoda. The hours that I worked at the restaurant were typically Friday and Saturday nights, and I believe an occasional Sunday afternoon brunch. Uh, you know, I was like the only dishwasher there for the most part, because during the week there weren't enough uh, customers on a Tuesday that they needed a full dishwasher staff. But definitely on the weekends, people treated themselves to some Cantonese and Chinese cuisine at uh, the Chinese Pagoda. Uh, it was a great experience also because it started the education of uh, actual Chinese food and Asian foods that were being created in the restaurant that, you know, some of it was served on the menu, but other times there were things they put in front of us that they didn't serve there, but it was their own recipes and the things they were making for themselves. And it was great. It was a great experience. Um, being a chunky kid all my life, boy, give, getting a, a, a free sampling of some delicious foods from the restaurant you work at is not a bad gig, especially when you're, you know, a growing teen. So, you know, get all the food you can, right? The owner's wife, Mrs. Young, she introduced me to uh, the sticky red pork bun. Uh, it's that white bun that you see, and then when you rip it open, and it's a steamed bun, you rip it open in the middle, there's this like little pocket of delicious uh, marinated red pork, and it is so good. I mean, First time I had it, and the first time I tried it, I really wasn't afraid of it. I just tried it and cemented my forever love for those pork buns. I didn't even dip it in soy sauce yet. I just had it straight up, and it was a, a flavor sensation that will uh, never escape me. It was super good. There are other things that she tried to introduce us to, and, you know, we tried it, but it wasn't, like, forced upon us. It was just, like, during the times when the chefs got their break post the dinner rush you know it was like 8 eight thirty. the chefs would break loose cook up their own food in the walks and you know prepare their own dishes and then sit around the you know the heat table and you know talk about whatever and then at the, whatever was left the dishwasher got and sometimes the meats they would cook up and whatever they cooked together and the the combinations of whatever home recipe or whatever they had on their, their mind that day of what they're going to make was just so good. Uh, I couldn't tell you what it was. That's the thing. It was like mystery meal, uh, every once in a while. And that was, that was a wonderfully fun thing to have hope for, to go into work every day and be like, I can't wait to see what kind of mystery Asian cuisine I'm going to eat today. It was super fun. The restaurant itself, uh, it, it uh, always had a crudite tray that they would put out for everybody, you know, in the same way that, you know, those like Italian delis or not even the Italian delis, just delis in general, Jewish delis. They would put out um, 
you know, crackers or bread or the, the tray of pickles or, you know, whatever. The same thing here. They had a, a crudite tray that would have like celery and carrots and black olives, green olives, pickles. It was just sort of a Midwestern crudite tray to snack on while you're waiting for your, you know, your delightful food to come out to the table. They always had it uh, in the area that I worked. It was just sort of this little small, you know, corner of the kitchen area. And directly, if I turned around from the sinks and I turned directly around, there was a double door shelved cooler that hosted all the, like the salad dressings and the mayonnaise and all the, uh, you know, all the crudite items in big jars, big glass jars or plastic jars that would hold pepperoncinis and all that. The cool part about being the dishwasher is that you somehow got access to eat that stuff. I mean, it's not like you could just stand at the doorway and put your hands in the uh, the pickle jar and, you know, just stand there and eat pickles. But if you wanted a little snack and they weren't serving any food, you were more than welcome to grab one of those little trays, throw a couple pickles, throw some olives down and put them over by your station. And I'm just, I'm like salivating thinking about it. <laughs> As I'm talking, my mouth is starting to like, mmm, water, talking about all these delightful crudite trays. Uh, I also learned a very valuable skill uh, early on, which was washing the rice. Uh, you know, good thing I already had practice in carrying and lifting giant bags of newspapers because every once in a while, you would, uh, when it was slow and the dishes weren't piled up, you were, uh, you know, brought on to do other tasks, you know, take out the garbage, hose off the back area near the, you know, the dumpster. And, you know, every once in a while you would help wash and rinse the rice out. She also taught us how to do uh, where you break off the ends of the snap peas as well. So there were different uh, little uh, skills that uh, the, the, restaurant, uh, the restaurant owner's wife uh, she, uh, would, you know, have us do as little side, side projects when it was slow during the dish time. So got to learn about that, got to learn about snap peas and why you break them and all that. It was just super fun as a, a first time job. I actually did love doing it. The other, uh, one of the other lessons I learned early on in my restaurant level of careers, uh, that I remember getting, it wasn't like we got yelled at, but we definitely got told this was that when the silverware came out of the uh, dishwasher and it was all hot and still wet, you should wipe it all down. I mean, you know, when you're at home and stuff comes out of the dishwasher or you're washing dishes, sometimes you don't really care that the forks and spoons and the knives are a little wet or there's some, you know, moisture on them or some, you know, splashes and whatever, it doesn't matter. You still throw it in the jar and don't look back and you're probably thinking, oh, well, those aren't going to rust. I'm not worried. Well, in the restaurant business, you really can't just do that because it leaves spots all over those dishes and then it just looks bad. So we had to learn how to like take all the silverware out and wipe it all down first before we took it out to the uh, kitchen area and put it all in this big wooden, they almost had like a curio cabinet where they had you know, the setups for napkins and the silverware and condiments and the soy sauce and all that. There was this big sort of wood cabinet right outside the uh, the doors. That was another lesson I had to learn too, by the way, is that was my first restaurant job. So I had to learn about in and outdoors. Uh, in restaurants, if they give you an in and outdoor, you definitely, definitely need to make sure you are going in the indoor and out the outdoor. Because any restaurant owner and any seasoned restaurant employee will tell you, if you do it the other way, you are almost guaranteed to run into somebody trying to get into the other, into the, the in the way correctly. And you are jam, you're going to smash them right in the face with that door because you're thinking, well, I'll just sneak through this time. Bad idea. Bad idea. So <laughs> lots of lessons in my first job. It was a great time. The, uh, you know, so doing the silverware thing and, of course, trying to make sure you're presentable so you're not just this big, you know, dirty, filthy, sweaty mess of a, a dishwasher going out into the dining room area. They actually made you wait on the silverware until, like, most of the guests were out of the dining room area where you were standing so they didn't see this, like, messy, wet teenage dishwasher throwing their silverware into this big bin for the uh, the servers and all that. 
Um, yeah, it was a great job. I, I again, I had fun with it. Uh, my pay rate for that job, I clearly remember, was three dollars and thirty five cents an hour. That was my starting rate, and I realistically only worked maybe four hours a night. So, I, you know, on a weekend, I was doing maybe 10 hours. So in a paycheck period, I was probably at the most making 50 bucks, maybe $60. And, but it was a, a light and easy job. I, it's not like, oh man, those are, you know, terrible wages and uh, it's, you know, whatever. For, again, for a 15 year old who shouldn't even legally be working, but has been given permission by the state and everybody under the sun, Making some kind of money without having to, you know, uh, traipse papers around at four in the morning. Yeah, my Friday nights were kind of, you know, cramped. Uh, but again, we were closed by nine. I was out of that place by 930. If I needed to hang out with my friends at a late night sleepover, play some late night games, video gaming, D&D, &D, getting off of working at 930, getting home by 10 or, you know, getting available by 10 wasn't a, a terrible thing. Again, especially for a teenager who is drinking Mountain Dew and Jolt Cola, time didn't matter on a Saturday morning after, you know, partying hard on a Friday night. Or even if I had to work on a Saturday. If I got cut early enough and the dishes looked cute and the place was ready to go, I was out of there again by like maybe 9.30, 10 o'clock at the latest. Plenty of time. Plenty of time to hang out with my friends late at night, stay up till four in the morning, sleepovers, hangouts, all that stuff. One of the most memorable experiences I had working at the Chinese Pagoda is every night that we worked and I closed the restaurant, you know, sometimes I even closed it on a Sunday if they closed early because nobody was in that restaurant. It was a done deal. So if the chefs prepared egg foo young early, so they would make, if anybody doesn't know what egg foo young is, it's that patty that's made with like egg and bean sprouts and chicken or whatever, you know, shrimp, whatever. And it's sort of this ball that, you know, or a, a patty, it's just, you know, fried in oil in the wok and it becomes this patty that you pour gravy over and it's amazing. Oh, check out egg foo young. As a child, I was hooked on egg foo young because that was a thing that my parents ordered as adults ordering Chinese food. So I got into it and Wong's Walk had some of the most amazing egg foo young ever that I've ever had. So as I was saying about Fridays and Saturday nights, if the chefs were preparing for any sort of rush and a lot of people ordered egg foo young at the time, they would make a big bowl of it, you know, put a big metal bowl of it all these little patties into it and throw it in under the heat lamp just so they didn't have to make a, you know, crap ton of fresh egg for young because it must have taken a while. So they just want to have it ready so they could throw it in the wok, heat it up, put it back in, get it ready. Life is good. So at the end of the night, if there was extra egg for young left over and they weren't planning to sell any, I got to take it home. And the way I would take it home is filling one of those empty plastic or glass jars that came from the crudite uh, items, like the pickles or the olives, whatever empty jars. They would keep some, of course, for storage or for whatever they needed, but they would have all these extra jars, and they gave me one, and they said, fill it up. And I don't know what, who planned this incorrectly or what have you, but they filled up an entire jar, like, one of those big glass jars filled with egg foo young and gravy. Oh, my parents were over, because I was still living at home, by the way, obviously, 50 years old, still living at home. And mind you, I also forgot a detail. Uh, I didn't have a car and neither did my parents. So getting to work was either walking or riding my coaster bike. Oh yes, I, drove, I rode a coaster bike, Pee Wee Herman style, when I rode my bike. That's how I got around the mean streets of Wauwatosa, Milwaukee as a 15 year old. I didn't have a 10 speed, I had a coaster bike. So I was taking home this, you know, 10 pound jar, a glass jar, mind you, of Egg Fu Young home one night. Bring it home, oh my God, my parents, my family, oh, wow. Like we, like I almost brought home a treasure chest. Oh, look at all this egg for young. It's so amazing. I can't wait. 
and we get through about halfway through the jar and my mom finds a dead fly in, in the jar. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, back then, you know, I mean, we threw it out, of course, because I think it was because we couldn't get through it fast enough before it seemed like, okay, this is probably going to turn soon enough. But the fly was absolutely the uh, the cherry on the sundae in the ways of, ooh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't eat any more of this. What are you going to do, kids? What are you going to do? Um, eventually, as the uh, job progressed, uh, I, you know, I stayed on it for quite a while. I think I was there for maybe, you know, I want to say at least six months. Uh, and my friend, my one of my best friends from high school, Dan, also got a job there. Um, they obviously needed more help. So they needed like either a day dishwasher or a second hand on Saturday nights. And I think he also took the Sunday shift. And there were times where we actually worked together. Now, of course, being best friends, we're going to be, you know, knuckleheads. We're 15 years old. Of course, we're going to mess around at work. I mean, the writing was on the wall. We're not going to be like, I'm a professional dishwasher. We're teenagers. We're goofy. We're going to, you know, either make fun of each other or just have a, have a goofy time at work and not realize that we're, you know, eventually it's going to cost one of us. Well, it didn't cost me. There was one day where Dan, where I, I don't even remember how this set up, but of course we're being goofy teenagers. And at some point it escalated to the levels where uh, Dan sprayed me with the shower thing, or the, the hose for the uh, dishwasher. And of course, revenge is sweet. So I uh, made the attempt to spray him and as he decided to jump and laugh out of the way, he decided to go out the indoor and <laughs> ran into one of the servers, causing a mess. And uh, he got blamed for it, of course. It wasn't a matter of whether or not I, oh, I sprayed him. Didn't matter. He was the one causing the ruckus and the problem. So Dan, unfortunately, got let go. He didn't get straight up fired, but it was one of those, yeah, don't come back. We're good. And I, I distinctly remember us ribbing Dan for quite a long time because he shared with us that uh, Mr. Paul Young, the, uh, the owner, labeled him in the exit conversation of you're too immature. <laughs> so Dan didn't live that down for quite a while. We were very much calling him immature and why are you so mature and mature became like the joke du jour between my friends at the time was how mature are you and why are you mature and <laughs> stop being so immature and uh it never ended so lots of laughs and lots of lessons and lots and lots of great chinese food for the chinese pagoda in wauwatosa wisconsin as I uh, leave out on this uh, this episode of the podcast, I do believe last year when I was in uh, Wauwatosa, I went back and visited Wisconsin and, you know, visited family back there and visited my old haunts as I do. And lo and behold, I want to let everybody know that the Chinese Pagoda is still there on the corner of 74th and North. It has not been replaced. It has not been steamrolled. It has not... You know, there has not been any sort of uh, gentrification that has taken out the Chinese pagoda. Uh, it is my duty, hopefully, before I uh, turn the ripe old age of 5 that I'm going to have to make a journey. Maybe that's what I should do with this podcast. Go back to every job I've ever had and either eat there or see if it exists or talk to an employee that I used to work with. That'll be the second level of this podcast and video cast for everybody to see as my journey is going back and visiting old job haunts. Maybe. We'll see. I'm all about suggestion. Anything's possible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and watching to New Job Who Dis. I am your host, Halston Body. I'll spell it again for you. H-A-L-S-T-O-N-B-O-D-D-Y. I am on Instagram. I am on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, even. Find me on TikTok. Damn you people. Uh, it... I am being hosted by Podbean. It has been a pleasure. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, we will be back on Monday with another scintillating story of a job that I had at the same time 
as my dishwasher job at the Chinese Pagoda. Please subscribe, please like, please share. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell your mom, tell somebody that you need to tune in to Halston Body here on YouTube and on any podcast network that you are hearing this lovely show on. This has been another edition of New Job. Who dis?